Hi, my name's David Veal and I'm a consultant psychiatrist at uh, the Maudsley Hospital and a visiting professor at King's College London. I'm going to talk today about the role of uh, psychedelics um, and especially in uh, body dysmorphic disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder, which is an area of research I'm particularly interested in. I'd like to thank today, uh, especially uh, my colleague Dr. James Rucker and uh, James Hawkins, who have uh, taught me about some of these concepts and um, also lent me one or two slides. So this is actually a personal story um, and I realised that I've gone full circle. I was a medical student at the Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead in about 1980 when I was co-editing a uh, medical student magazine called Free Comment which I picked up um, and found in my archives and um, we managed to get an interview with R.D. Lang who was based just around the corner from us and one of his interests of course was in psychedelics uh, which we discussed with him and in the article he said he would argue the case to be available um, to, for psychedelics to be available to a subset of doctors and that, of course, is what happens now with home office licences to get a prescription of a uh, psilocybin for research. Um, but um, he was quite an interesting character, Ronnie Lang. So what are psychedelics? There's about four classic psychedelics which all act on serotonin receptors. There's mescaline, of course, which we associate um, with the Aztecs. There is psilocybin, which comes from derived from magic mushrooms. Then there is DMT, which is from more South America. And uh, LSD, which was synthesized. Um, so psychedelics, just in broad terms, have been used by humans for many thousands of years. Um, the term psychedelic is, um, means mind revealing and it was a term introduced by a British psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond in the 1950s. They were used in psychiatry prior to 1970 particularly for things like depression and alcoholism. Um, they were probably effective then and safe if you excluded those liable to psychosis. Um, I will be showing to you how uh, psychedelics are not dangerous relative to other psychotropic drugs. Recent small studies suggest that when given a, in a supportive environment, they are safe and may be effective in treatment resistant depression, anxiety and, and alcoholism but their status as a class one illegal drug is very unscientific. We'd like to do more research in this area, but because it's a class one drug, it makes research very difficult and very um, expensive. So um, what effect does a one-off taking of uh, psilocybin or, you know, give you? Um, well, in healthy volunteers given psilocybin compared to a group who receive a placebo or a dummy drug, um, things look, uh, they report that things look strange, they the more they see geometric patterns, unusual bodily sensations, um, their imagination becomes more vivid, they may laugh more, thoughts wander more freely, they lose a self sense of their self and time and um, the, the generally it's just a, a more dreamlike quality and if you do brain scans of people receiving um, uh, psilocybin compared to a placebo it, it can show you how it increases connectivity and crosstalk between the different brain regions so it's all opening up lots of channels in the brain and in general, as you get older, your brains become less flexible, emotions become more integrated and controlled, and you get more conceptual integration. And the psychedelics seem to induce a temporary window of uh, cognitive flexibility during which 
very entrenched, maladaptive patterns of behaviour and rumination that can be broken down. And that's why we think it might be helpful, especially in body dysmorphic disorder, OCD and sort of very depressive ruminations, because as you know, it's, it can become very rigid patterns of thinking and behaving which just go round and round. So um, it can be helpful to think of the brain like a mountain with these sort of deep ski tracks of rumination, thinking very rigid patterns of worry and vicious spirals of habits. So a psychedelic trip is a bit like sort of heavy fall of snow, opening a window of neural plasticity that allows new and healthier ways of thinking, feeling and acting. But what happened uh, in the end of the 60s when psychedelics became illegal? I mean, there was some medical concerns about having psychologically toxic reactions, and um, especially in those people who were uh, suffering from psychosis. But there was arguably much more concern by the politicians about suppressing uh, inexpedient groups um, and LSD, marijuana, magic mushrooms and so on have become sort of pharmacological symptoms, symbols of the counterculturalism. And um, this is particularly true um, of LSD, I guess, but, uh, but you can see here these very old bottles of um, psilocybin. But, as I said, it all became illegal at the end of um, the uh, 60s and you got the UK Misuse of Drugs Act in 1971. But, and, and also associated with that, was a massive decrease in the amount of research that was conducted. So you can see the number of psychedelic publications here, the proportion of total publications became massively much lower. They're beginning to increase now um, but, you know, it's far less than what it used to be. So, the question is, can psychedelics, first of all, cause harm? Um, and we can think about this either in terms of physiological harm, the sort of biological toxicity of the drug on the body tissues, and what psychological harm might it cause? So, first of all, it's worth looking at... Um, the number of people who died from overdoses from uh, prescription and illicit drugs. And you can see that compared to opioids, pain relievers, benzodiazepines, things like Valium and so on, cocaine, heroin, the number of people who've died from an overdose is, is virtually z none, zero, um, from psychedelics. And actually, if you look at this in more detail, the last known um, death from an overdose was in 1994 on the coroner's um, death certificate. That was one death that year. Um, LSD, a few more. Um, the, the last one was in 2003. One death. And we can look at the toxic ratio, in other words, the ratio of fatal dose to an effective dose is massively different um, in uh, psilocybin LSD. You know, you need about a thousand times the dose to get uh, something that is lethal, as opposed to you know heroin intravenously. Um, only five times the, the dose could get, could make it uh, lethal as such. So, you know, they're very safe drugs in terms of the toxic ratio. And if you look at people who've used um, psychedelics recreationally, that um, the, the number of suicide attempts in people are greater. You can see people who've using um, lifetime, anytime use of marijuana, pain relievers, uh, inhalants, PCP and so on, tranquilizers, sedatives, all puts you at risk of, of um, make, having a suicide attempt. But actually, it's actually less in people who've used um, a psychedelic. And if you rank all 
drugs and illegal substances. You'll find that the um, psilocybin, magic mushrooms, LSD are right at the bottom of the pile compared to alcohol, heroin, cocaine and so on. And the red is harm to others and the, the, the turquoise is in harm to yourself. So, you know, it, it's again recognised that they're not um, physiologically harmful. So the question then becomes, how do you make psilocybin into a medicine? Now, normally, um, if you're trying to develop a drug, you know, you first of all try it out in what in, in uh, healthy volunteers, and you're really trying to find out is the drug safe relative to the uh, disease, is the drug effective, and then you move into uh, phase one trials and phase two. We are doing feasibility studies of small trials. You're checking for side effects, the safety and, and the effectiveness of it. And psilocybin at the moment is really at that sort of phase one, two stage. The main obstacles is doing uh, money. Um, so if I want to do a trial in body dysmorphic disorder, I have to raise about 250k for about a, a trial with 60 patients because I'm saying if it's a Schedule One drug, it makes it very expensive to do research. We have a manufacturer to source the drug, um, but the problem being is there's still a lot of stigma that interferes in trying to do such research. Um, so normally I'm saying it takes about 15, 17 years to get a drug to be approved, um, and you know that's, it's always slow research. So what happens if you have a one-off dose of psilocybin? The, it usually lasts for about five to seven hours. The peak effects are within about 70 to 90 minutes. The dose range is usually between about 10 to 30 milligrams. This is at a very high toxicity ratio. It's very safe to take and there's no withdrawal symptoms. So the question is what's the evidence so far for the use of psilocybin in, in psychiatric disorders? Well, my colleague James Rucker has done a nice review in July 2019, and their conclusion was that randomised control trials support the effectiveness of psilocybin in the treatment of depression and cancer-related anxiety. Um, so there is four small control trials all demonstrating benefits in treatment-resistant depression. Uh, and there has been one um, trial in end-of-life anxiety in patients with cancer. There's been some small case series showing benefit in people with Alzheimer's and AIDS survivors. Um, and in uh, using um, uh, in people addicted to smoking, cocaine or, or alcohol. Uh, some other small case series in people with migraines and anorexia nervosa. And one that interests me in, in obsessive compulsive disorder, nine patients who failed standard treatment had a reduction of about 23 to 100% of their symptoms. So it all looks very promising. And that's why, to me, when I know how difficult it can be to treat OCD and BDD, we need more research and actually progress things to be able to demonstrate that this is, you know, looks a very potential um, helpful treatment for patients. And also to actually really what hap know what happens in the long term and if people have to have uh, a second dose um, years to come. So um, when you do a randomised controlled trial, you have to um, be able to randomise so that patients do not know or the um, doctor does not know whether they're receiving a active drug here, uh, psilocybin, or whether they're receiving placebo. And it's always done with psychological support. So you do various measures beforehand, and you do them, repeat them after the experience of taking the psilocybin, because this is just a one-off occasion. And... Um, you may then go on to doing a second dose of psilocybin six weeks later um, so that the people who have the placebo also have a first dose of psilocybin. Again, to explore whether there's any extra benefit from having a second dose. 
and the at present in this country the manufacturer who provides the psilocybin is called Compass and this is a, an, an example of prescription for the um, drug used at the Maudsley Hospital. And you do this in a um, quiet, reflective room. The session is always supported by one specially trained therapist and a chaperone. Um, treatments are designed for a non-clinical, calming environment. You, you listen to a specially designed music playlist that follows the metabolism of psilocybin through a high fidelity sound system. And um, as I'm saying, most patients then receive, get a sense of connectedness, emotional catharsis, and uh, of acceptance, and, and try, they, they tend to gain a more new perspectives on life. Um, so in terms, just to summarise then, safety, it's not been associated with any uh, disease of any organ or system. There have been no serious adverse events occurred during recently published studies over about 3,000 sessions. Verified fatalities are exceedingly rare in recreational use and usually from ingesting poisonous mushrooms accidentally. There is a theoretical risk of serotonin toxicity. However, it's never been reported and would need the dose many times greater than practically used. There is again a theoretical risk of aggravating cardiovascular disease due to the temporary effect on heart rate and blood pressure. However, again, it's never happened in practice and patients at risk with heart disease are excluded from such studies. What about psychiatric safety? There is often some transient anxiety at the onset of action. Um, transient perceptual disturbances are self-limiting and rare. Um, there's no evidence of prolonged psychotic reactions in modern studies with patients who are properly screened and prepared and supported during the session. Um, there's no evidence for self-danger, self-harm under supportive clinical conditions. There is something called a hallucinogenic persistent perception disorder. Again, this seems to be extremely rare and there's no cases reported in modern studies. What about addiction? Uh, there's no physical withdrawal. It's not associated with compulsive drug seeking. It's not classically rewarding and more described as challenging at times. What about the risk of bad trips? Well, a bad trip might be a strong and prolonged anxiety or paranoia caused by these perceptual disturbances or strong emotional negative emotions emerging memories about past events 
So again, this is extremely rare in patients who've been properly screened, prepared and supported. It's different from um, challenging experiences which are to be embraced as they can produce meaningful resolutions and long-lasting clinical improvements. So I hope that's been a helpful overview use of psychedelics. Um, and uh, please contact me if you're a philanthropist or have crowdfunding skills for a trial in BDD. I don't think this is impossible. We could also try to get a grant, but these are very difficult. Um, and uh, please subscribe to my channel if you want further information. Thanks.